Hello, welcome to my video on what is chemical potential. Uh, my name is John Morrow and I am a professor of materials science and engineering at Penn State University. Uh, today what we're going to do is go into some of the background of the concept of chemical potential and learn what it really means. This is one of the most commonly used variables in the field of thermodynamics, but a lot of people have trouble understanding it sometimes. So we're going to try to demystify this concept of chemical potential. Now the concept of chemical potential goes back to the founder of thermodynamics, Josiah Willard Gibbs, who formally introduced this concept of chemical potential way back in 1876. Now, when Gibbs first introduced this concept, he didn't call it the chemical potential right away. Uh, initially, he called it the intrinsic potential of the system. Uh, later on, he adopted the term chemical potential. Uh, and this proved to be a key concept for establishing Gibbs' fundamental equation of thermodynamics. So chemical potential um, is not only important, it is one of the most important concepts uh, providing this foundation of the entire field of thermodynamics. Now, what I would like to do today is to give the approach to chemical potential uh, that has been put forth by my dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Long Ching Chen, who is the Hammer Professor of Material Science and Engineering here at Penn State. Uh, Dr. Chen is the author of this amazing textbook, Thermodynamic Equilibrium and Stability of Materials. This is the thermodynamics textbook that I wish I had when I was a student. Um, Dr. Chen is someone who um, understands thermodynamics so intuitively and appreciates the elegance of the field. And um, if other thermodynamic books are kind of like prose, this book is, is like poetry. Um, I highly recommend it. I actually have two copies because it really is that good, uh, one for the office and one for home. So be sure to pick up a copy of that. A, a lot of what I'm covering today is from chapter one in this book. And there's one other reference by Long Ching Chen as well. Uh, this is a, an opinion piece that was published in MRS Bulletin, the Materials Research Society's uh, bulletin publication. This is called Chemical Potential and Gibbs Free Energy. So the content of this presentation draws from both of these sources. Uh, so let's start off with the concept of the internal energy of a system. Uh, if we have the internal energy of some thermodynamic system, uh, we think of that as consisting of three different contributions. So the internal energy here is given by a capital U, and the three different components to that are the thermal energy, um, so this is the energy that's associated with thermal processes, you know, having a, a temperature of the system. Uh, so this is U sub T uh, plus the mechanical energy, U sub M, plus the chemical energy. And if you add all three of these contributions of the energy together, thermal energy plus mechanical energy plus chemical energy, that gives you the total internal energy of the system. Uh, now, there are different types of matter that are associated with these three different types of energy. Uh, for a simple system, there are three basic variables that represent these three types of matter. If we start off with thermal energy, the corresponding type of matter is thermal matter, and that is the entropy of the system, which is denoted by the capital letter S. Um, likewise, going to mechanical energy, the corresponding matter there, the mechanical matter is volume, the volume V, how much space the system takes up. And then lastly, uh, the corresponding matter uh, to chemical energy is the chemical matter, and that is denoted N, which is the number of moles of a given chemical species in the system. So we have three types of energies, the thermal energy, mechanical energy, chemical energy, and then three corresponding types of matter, the thermal matter, which is entropy, mechanical matter, which is volume, and the chemical matter of the system, which is N, the number of moles of the system. Um, now, what is a potential? If we want to understand what chemical potential is, we have to understand what a potential is in general. And uh, the general definition of a potential is the amount of a given type of energy 
per unit of the corresponding matter. Uh, so for example, some potential would be the amount of energy here divided by the amount of the corresponding matter. And the interesting thing about potential is that what we're doing is taking two extensive quantities, both the energy and the matter are extensive quantities, meaning that they scale linearly, they scale proportionally with the size of the system. So if you double the size of the system, you would double the amount of energy, and you'd also double the amount of matter. Now, if you take two extensive quantities like energy and matter, and take the quotient of them, so divide them, then that takes out that proportionality. And what you get is that an intensive um, property, something that does not scale with the size of the system. So since the energy and the matter are both extensive quantities, when you divide them, you get an intensive quantity, which is the potential. So the potential is telling us how much energy per the amount of corresponding matter. And the potential, we can think of this as representing the stability of its corresponding matter. If you have a higher potential, then that matter is less stable. And thermodynamics is going to drive the system towards um, then lower values of the potential. Uh, what is an example of a potential? Something that you probably already know is the electric potential. The electric potential is defined as just the amount of electric energy in a system divided by the amount of electric matter. Uh, we can represent the amount of electrical energy as U sub E, and then the amount of electrical matter, the, the total charge here of Q, and dividing those two together, you get the electrical potential, uh, which is the voltage of the system. So this is just a, a commonly known electric potential, the voltage of the system, which of course has units of volt. Now what about going back to our thermodynamic potentials for our three different types of energy and three different types of corresponding matter? Um, starting off with our thermal energy, if we divide the amount of thermal energy, U sub T, by the amount of thermal matter, the entropy of the system, that gives us the thermal potential. The thermal energy and the thermal matter are both extensive quantities. So if you double the size of the system, you're going to double the amount of thermal energy and also double the amount of thermal matter, doubling the entropy. So dividing the two gives you an intensive quantity, the thermal potential, which is better known as the temperature of the system, T. So temperature is just another commonly known thermodynamic potential. Um, that is describing uh, the amount of thermal energy divided by the amount of thermal matter. Now, if we go to mechanical potential, uh, this is simply defined as the amount of mechanical energy divided by the amount of mechanical matter. So this is U sub M divided by, then the amount of mechanical matter is the volume of the system. Again, two extensive quantities, when divided, give us the intensive quantity, the mechanical potential, and this is better known as the pressure, or more specifically, the negative pressure, because of how pressure is being defined as um, a hydrostatic compression rather than a tension. Um, that's why this picks up the minus sign here. But this mechanical potential is simply the pressure or the negative pressure of the system. Now, what is the chemical potential? The chemical potential is the amount of chemical energy divided by the amount of chemical matter. So this is U sub C, our amount of chemical potential, or chemical energy, divided by N, the number of moles of chemical matter. And if you divide those two quantities, you get the chemical potential, and the standard symbol for that is the lowercase Greek letter mu. Uh, so mu is the chemical potential of the system, and it is simply the chemical energy divided by the amount of chemical matter. Uh, now what we're going to learn soon is that this chemical energy, another better known term for this, is the Gibbs free energy. So we're going to see how we can get the Gibbs free energy um, from this uh, chemical energy. Um, so to do that, what we need to do is add up our total internal energy of the system. Our total internal energy, U, is equal to the summation of the thermal energy plus the mechanical energy 
plus the chemical energy. Now, using our equations here, we can express this um, in terms of the uh, corresponding potentials multiplied by the amounts of thermal matter. So, for example, if you take this uh, equation here for the thermal potential, multiply both sides of this equation by entropy, what you have is that the thermal, en the thermal energy is equal to the temperature of the system times the entropy. So another way to write this thermal energy is T times S. The absolute temperature of the system, always expressed in units of Kelvin, of course, in the field of thermodynamics. Um, so the absolute temperature of the system multiplied by the entropy. And that's what gives you the amount of uh, thermal energy. Now, if we move on to our mechanical energy, um, again, what we want to do is multiply both sides of this equation by the amount of matter. So we multiply by the amount of the mechanical matter, the volume of the system. And what we have is that the mechanical energy is equal to minus the pressure times the volume of the system. So instead of U sub M, we can replace this by minus the pressure times the volume of the system. Let's do the same thing for the chemical energy. The chemical energy is simply the chemical potential times the amount of chemical matter. So it's the chemical potential mu times the number of moles of the chemical species N. And this is what replaces the chemical energy. So this is how we get that the total internal energy of the system U is equal to Ts, temperature times entropy, minus PV, pressure times volume, plus mu times n, the chemical potential times the number of moles. Now, if we take this equation here for the internal energy, what we can do is rearrange some of these terms. So first thing we want to do is to move the minus PV over to the left-hand side of the equation. When we do that, we have an internal energy plus PV on the left-hand side of the equation. You probably recognize this. This is better known as the enthalpy of the system. The internal energy plus pressure times volume is just the enthalpy, uh, and that is usually given by the symbol H. Uh, but we also want to take this Ts, this temperature times the entropy, and move that to the left-hand side of the equation. When we do that, that becomes a minus Ts, and then the left-hand side of the equation becomes the Gibbs free energy. So the enthalpy minus Ts is the Gibbs free energy of the system. You can write that as H minus Ts or as U plus PV minus Ts. They both mean the same thing and those are both indicating the Gibbs free energy of the system. Now, once we move the Ts and the minus PV terms to the left-hand side of the equation, the only thing that is left on the right-hand side of the equation is the chemical potential times N, and that's what we have here on the right-hand side of the equation. We know from the previous slide that the chemical potential times N is equal to the chemical energy, um, and therefore this is equal to the Gibbs free energy of the system. So the Gibbs free energy is simply the chemical potential times the number of moles. What this means is that if this gives free energy is the chemical potential times the number of moles, then the chemical potential is simply the Gibbs free energy of the system divided by N. So it is the Gibbs free energy of the system divided by the number of moles of the chemical species. Um, this is also sometimes known as the molar Gibbs free energy. Um, so what is the Gibbs free energy per mole of the system? And this is actually an unnecessary concept because as you can see, this uh, molar Gibbs free energy is really just the chemical potential of the system. So it is much better to, um, to use the terminology chemical potential rather than introducing another um, unnecessary term like molar Gibbs free energy. So um, what about a multi-component system? What I just showed was for um, just a single component system. Uh, 
the same thing applies for any multi-component system if it is homogeneous. Suppose that you have an n component system, so the small n here is the number of components. Um, again, we can write the Gibbs free energy of the system is equal to the chemical potential times the number of moles, the total number of moles n. And if we want to write that out in terms of each of the individual components of this multi-component system, then that mu times n becomes equal to mu1 times n1. So this is the chemical potential of component 1 times the number of moles of component 1 plus the chemical potential of component 2 times the number of moles of component 2 plus dot dot dot. And this summation continues until you get to the final component of the system. Then you've got the chemical potential of that component times the number of moles of that component. And then adding this all together then gives you the total Gibbs free energy of the system. So another way to express the same thing would be to define the mole fraction of each component. The mole fraction is x sub i. So this would be the mole fraction of component i in the system. And that mole fraction is defined as simply n sub i over n. So the number of moles of that particular component i divided by the to total number of moles in the system. And if you use this definition of mole fraction, then and, we, and if we apply that to this equation up above, then it's readily apparent that the chemical potential of a homogeneous n component system uh, so the mu here of this multi-component system is simply equal to this weighted summation of each of the chemical potentials of each of the components of the system weighted by their corresponding mole fractions. So mu is equal to mu1 times x1 plus mu2 times x2 plus dot 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 um, mu n times xn. So this concept of chemical potential and the concept it gives free energy um, is equally applicable to multi-component systems um, as well as to single component systems. Now these mu sub n's and uh, or sorry the mu sub mu sub 1, mu sub 2, and so on through mu sub n. Um, these are sometimes called the partial molar Gibbs free energies. Um, but that is, again, an unnecessary concept because really they're just chemical potentials. So it's, it's better um, not to use that terminology, but to stick to the terminology of chemical potentials. Now, what are some of the units uh, of chemical potential and other potentials here? Um, the thermal potential is, of course, the temperature of the system. And as you know, the unit for temperature is Kelvin, uh, named in honor of Lord Kelvin, one of the pioneers um, in this area of science. And that is abbreviated with the capital letter K. Uh, the mechanical potential is the pressure. And the units for that are the Pascal, uh, likewise named after one of the famous scientists who worked in that area. Uh, for electric potential, the unit is the volt, named after Volta, uh, one of the pioneers in understanding the, the physics of electrical systems. Now, what about the chemical potential here, mu? Uh, the chemical potential doesn't really have its own unit, at least not yet. Um, the units that are used would be joules per mole, so the amount of energy per number of moles in the system. So this is typically expressed as joules per mole. Uh, however, Dr. Chen has proposed in his uh, opinion piece in MRS Bulletin that since all these other potentials are named after famous scientists who were um, instrumental in developing these concepts that we use, it would also be appropriate to have a special unit for chemical potential in honor of the scientist who pioneered that. So he proposes that we could use the unit Gibbs uh, to represent the chemical potential. So a Gibbs would be equal to a joule per mole, and the Gibbs would be denoted with the uh, capital letter G. And the way that we don't distinguish this between um, the Gibbs free energy, uh, which is also the letter G versus the unit Gibbs, is that the Gibbs free energy as a variable is an italicized G, whereas the unit here for Gibbs uh, is not italicized. So it's just a, a Roman G. So to summarize, uh, the chemical potential is simply the Gibbs free energy of the system divided by uh, the number of moles of chemical species. So the chemical potential is G divided by N. 
Um, chemical potential can be defined for pure substances or for multi-component systems. Uh, the terms molar gives free energy and partial molar gives free energy are unnecessary concepts because they are simply chemical potentials. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this lecture on uh, chemical potential. I hope that this all made sense. Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions. And if you like this video, please be sure to uh, click that like button and subscribe to the channel. Uh, so thank you very much and hope you have a great day.